now we're recording. Okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Let me, let me, I'm just going to get the details out of there and not share it because that, that doesn't help anybody. So let me go back and look at that and get the data up here on my board and then we can talk about it. Uh, okay, let's see. Is that it? There it is. Okay, so let me write this up here. The carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. 35 milligrams of CO2. And 28.6 milligrams of water. I'm probably going to have like a million questions while you do this. I'm sorry? I said I'm probably going to have like a million questions while you do this. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I think I've got oh, 35 milligrams total. All right, so I've got all the information I need and there's what we've got in the problem, 35 milligrams of the total sample. And when we, the sample was actually put in that combustion chain that I showed you uh, during the last lecture and oxygen was passed over the sample and it uh, was converted to carbon dioxide Hydrogen's converted to water, and nitrogen um, is the difference. We know what the carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen are, or we will know in a minute. And then the difference of these two from 35 is what nitrogen is. So we need to find out what that is. The best way to do that <coughs> is to work with a percentage by mass. So what's the percent by mass in carbon dioxide of carbon and you know how to calculate that you just put how much does carbon weigh in this sample is 12.01 right and how much is the total carbon dioxide well it's 12.01 plus two times the oxygen okay uh, times 100 that's mass percent so let me get my calculator and this is 12.01 and again plus 32 for oxygen is this is 44.01 divided into 12.01 okay so that's uh, 27.29 percent. So 27.29% uh, of that value is carbon. Now, um, I'm going to use the fractional equivalent of 27.29 so that I don't have to do a lot of um, uh, dimensional analysis over here. Now, eh, maybe I better. So let's say uh, 35 milligrams of carbon dioxide, okay? So what does this mean? 27.29% parts per hundred. So it could be grams, it could be milligrams. It's so many milligrams per hundred milligrams, or so many grams per hundred grams. That's what percent means. I need to look at the camera, don't I? So if we say this much um, carbon per sample, then we would say 27.29 um, milligrams of carbon for every 100 milligrams of CO2. 
That's what that means, parts per hundred. So that cancels these milligrams. And now you divide this by 100 and multiply by 27.29. What I was going to do, uh, there's the camera. What I was going to do was just change this to the fractional equivalent, 0.2729, and multiply it times 35 and get the same result. And the reason I can do that is because 100 divided into 27.29 is 0.2729. But this shows you the uh, dimensional analysis aspect of the calculation. So if we do that calculation times 35, then we get 9.551, 9.551 milligrams of carbon in that sample. Okay, does everybody follow so far? If I don't Good hear any objections. I'll continue if I don't hear any objections. When we do the same thing for water. You just need to calculate what's the percent by mass of hydrogen in water. So that would be um, in fact, I'm not even going to go to percent this time. I'm going to go, since I've already showed you how it works, I'm just going to go to the fractional equivalent. So I'm going to leave out the times 100. So we have uh, hydrogen, which is 2 times 1.01 .01 in the numerator and in the denominator, plus what's oxygen. There we go. So the fractional equivalent of that is 0 0.112, 0 0.1121. That's the fractional equivalent of hydrogen in water. So if we multiply that times that, we get uh, 3.206. milligrams. So that's how much hydrogen is in that sample. Okay. All right, now that we have those values, I can write them in here. I'm going to move down here with it, this carbon. 9.551 milligrams of carbon. And 3.206 milligrams of hydrogen. Okay, let's unclutter things. There we go. That doesn't need to be. So how much nitrogen do we have? Well, you add this one together with that one. Let's see if I've still got it in here. Yep. So this together is 12.757. Subtract that from 35. And the leftover is 22. 22 point two four three milligrams. Now we're at the point where we were yesterday when I showed you how to do empirical formulas. Only this time we don't have um, we don't have grams and we're not basing it on a hundred. But if we use molar mass We've got, um, and we want to cancel, we've got uh, need grams there. Right, see how many moles there are in this sample. Now, I'm tempted to, to tell you this. These ratios, this mass ratio, uh, based on the 
the law of definite proportions is the same whether it's milligrams or grams. That mass ratio has established as any, as long as the unit of measure is the same for each one, then the mass ratio is always the same. Okay? So we could change that to grams and save ourselves a lot of trouble when we use the molar mass. Right? If I change this to grams, the ratio is still exactly the same as it was when it was milligrams. So that being said, we can use molar mass now. Henry Ford. We can use uh, molar mass for each one to find out how many moles there are in each one. And that'll give us the mole ratio. And nitrogen is what? Look it up, 14.01. Let's see, did somebody else show up? Okay. All right, no, we're good. Okay. So now we just need to do the, uh, uh, the math. It is 0.795. And that's moles. So now we're getting the mole ratio, and that's what we need to write the formula, because the formula is ratio of numbers of atoms, moles of atoms. Okay, 32.06, uh, 3.206, back up. 0 0.206, and 1.01, that's 3.17. And 22.43 and 14.01 gives us 1.601 or 1.60 moles of each one of these. All right. So now what do we do? Remember what comes next? I still, yeah, I'm still there. So now we get need to get whole number ratios. And the easiest way to do that is take the smallest one and divide everything by that number. Remember, we've established the ratio already. So anything we do to each one, as long as we do the same thing, we get, um, we haven't changed the ratio. So if we divide that one by 0.795, Let's divide the whole thing by 0 0.795, each one of them. So this one now is 1, and 3.17.795. This one is now uh, rounded off to the nearest whole number. It's very close, 3.987. So that's rounded off to 4. And 1.6 divided by 0.795. Now, do you always divide by the smallest number? Or? That's the simplest approach. Yeah. Okay. That's the simplest approach. Because um, if your data is really good, if the error is small, then that's probably the only step that you'll need to get to the whole number ratio. The way you do it is so much simpler. The way the computer does it is confusing as can be. Like when it, how you get it wrong and it shows you how to do it. Oh, oh, yeah. I apologize for that. And that's why I was getting so mad. I've done the same problem like five times and kept getting it wrong and I was getting mad. Um, yeah, those, those homework problems were probably written by um, chemists. And chemists think everybody thinks like they do. No, they need don't. new people to do it. Yeah. See, I'm I'm not a chemist by training. 
I just got enough chemistry in, at the graduate level to teach it. I'm really a soil scientist. So I look for really practical approaches. Um, so my guess is the first hurdle was, was figuring out what these values were for the masses. You had to use the mass percents to extract that information from the total. And after that, then you already have the procedure. Now, uh, the empirical formula then would be C, one of those, four of these, and two of those, CH4N2. Now, I'm not sure what they say the answer is, but I know that's the right answer. I just like the way you do it better than they do. <laughs> Your way doesn't make me want to cry. <laughs> that's good news. Okay, any, any other questions before we actually get to some new material? Of course, this is a, this is a necessary skill. So moving on to new material is, is not good until we have this problem solved. Okay. Something tells me going to, I'm going to run long today. So the same rule applies. Uh, if you have to go at a quarter to two, then go ahead and I'll just keep talking until I'm finished with the lecture. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right. Um, we'll move that over a little bit. So I'm not constantly in the middle. Okay. <clears throat> so let's move on to um, chapter four, which discusses types of reaction and solution stoichiometry. Remember when I was talking about stoichiometry before, we were going from mass to moles and then moles of this to moles of that, and then back to mass. That's one type of problem. There's another type that, that where the reactions take place in solution. And you determine how many moles of reactants you have by a slightly different process. Because we don't have mass to start with, we just have a, a certain volume of a solution at a given concentration. And I'll get to that as we move along. Uh, oh, hold on a second. I got to let. There we go. Yesenia got kip, kicked out, I guess. And like I said before, this is the way I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to keep the waiting room up uh, just to keep Zoom bombers out of our meeting. Um, oh, I did receive an email a couple of days ago that said Zoom is going to require, uh, the meetings are going to be automatically um, waiting room and they're going to insist on passwords. So I may be forced anyway to um, redo all the meetings from, but if that's the case, then I'll have it done by Tuesday and I'll send everybody an email updating. Well, actually, no, just go to your Zoom the way you would normally do in the course, in the Blackboard course, and the link's going to be changed. So you won't even have to think about it. And of course, the link will also have an embedded password, so you won't have to remember the password either. So I'm, I think I'm fretting too much over a, a little bit. Uh, okay. So there's everybody. And let me share. Where am I? Recording. Um, here. here we go. Share. So I'm going to share the PowerPoints now. Let me start the slideshow. Okay. Now, um, 
Let's see. We're going to be talking about different types of chemical reactions in addition to solution stoichiometry. So we're, we're going to cover a good bit of ground in chapter four. Uh, but just recognize that this is an introduction and the real meat of the course is going to be in working the problems. So I definitely want to get through with this chapter today so that we won't eat into our uh, review time on Tuesday. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, we're going to talk about solutions in this course and for all intents and purposes, when we say solutions, we're going to talk about water as the solvent. That is, it's the major component. That's what everything else goes into. <clears throat> And uh, water is an extremely effective solvent for, of course, for all um, molecules that are, let's see, have we defined polar yet? I don't think we have. We haven't. Okay, so let me give you the short version. A polar molecule is one that, that has a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side. And it, it comes from the use of poles in magnets. Magnet has a north and a south pole. Molecules have a, a negative and a positive pole. Sometimes. If they are polar, they do have that. In this case, we're seeing that uh, the water molecule does have slightly negative toward the oxygen, slightly positive toward the hydrogen side. So that means it's attracted to other polar molecules and it's attracted to ions that happen to be in solution. So when you put th something like uh, sodium chloride in aqueous solution, what it does is it completely breaks apart into its constituent ions. Okay. So, unlike charges attract one another. So what's gonna happen? Well, the sodium ion, which is positive, is gonna be attracted to the negative side. And the chloride ion, which is the negative side, is gonna be attracted to the positive side of the molecule. And what that effectively does is it makes water a good solvent for polar molecules and for ions. But it's not so polar that it excludes all nonpolar molecules. So if you have molecules that are uh, nonpolar, and the example that, that comes to mind is um, uh, carbon dioxide. So if you write carbon dioxide, it's linear that way. And what that does is, even though oxygen is, uh, pulls on electrons more strongly than carbon, so makes it slightly negative that side, well, this side also pulls and makes the carbon slightly positive. That's what that little delta means. That, that squiggly thing that is sort of a stylized D, that's actually a Greek letter delta. And that little delta with a sign on it means slight. It's a slight charge. It's not a complete charge. What do you need for a complete charge? You need transfer of electrons, complete from one place to another, from one molecule to another, from one atom to another. That gives you an ion. And then you don't have the little delta. You just have the sign, like we did for sodium and chlorine, or chloride. But if it's just a slight displacement of charge, then you get slightly negative here, slightly negative there, and slightly positive in the middle because it's lost some of the electron density that it needs to maintain neutrality. So what does that do for this molecule? Well, we use a sign like that. This arrow points toward the negative and there's your positive end. This is called um, 
a dipole moment. It's a dipole in the negative direction. And this one has just the opposite. So they're opposite direction and equal in magnitude. They cancel one another out. So that means carbon dioxide is nonpolar. Overall, the molecule is does not have uh, a pole to it. So you would expect that it would not be attracted to water. And, and that's true in one sense, but it's still attracted to water in another sense because overall, that's nonpolar. But it still has this slightly negative character on the ends. So that gives it a little bit of attraction to water. Um, okay, that's enough detail for now. We're, we're gonna get more later anyway. Um, the characteristic here that we're focusing on is the fact that water is a polar molecule and it's polar because of two things. The bond between oxygen and hydrogen is shifted slightly negative toward oxygen on both of them. Now, if water were linear, like carbon dioxide, it would be a nonpolar molecule. But since it's bent, and I haven't shown you why that is, but just take my word for it for now, the oxygen molecule is bent, the sum of these dipole moments is net in the direction of oxygen. Now, if any of you had, had physics um, or physical science, you'll understand the term vector. There are two types of summation in the physical world. One is a linear summation, and you just add the numbers together. The other is a vector summation. And vector summation requires that you take not just the magnitude of the, uh, the unit of measure, but its direction. And since the direction for this uh, bond is net that direction, and this one is net that direction, the vector sum gives you a dipole moment toward the oxygen. <clears throat> okay, let me move on. An ionic solid dissolves in water because of its polar nature. Notice how water molecules become attached to the ions of a sodium chloride crystal in a process called hydration. Positively charged sodium ions attract the partial negative charge of the oxygen in water. A similar attraction occurs between negatively charged chloride ions and the hydrogen atoms, which have a partial positive charge. These interactions loosen the attractions between the <coughs> ions in the crystal, dislodging them from the crystal. Additional water molecules surround the released ions, insulating them from attraction to other ions. Okay. <clears throat> so what's happening is, it's a process called solvation. It's where the solvent attacks, and the other term for that, uh, it's solvent, in this case is water, for example, water, and the solute is what's going into water, in this case is sodium chloride, okay? So what happens is the solvent uh, molecules um, just randomly impact the crystal, and if they're oriented properly, so that the, say for instance, the negative side of the water molecule is oriented toward the sodium ion that's in the crystal, then there's an attraction there. And that attraction um, is relatively strong. It's not as strong as, as a covalent bond. It's not as strong as an ionic bond between sodium and chlorine. But it's not just the solvent molecule that's approaching the, Let's see, the sodium will be this little black dot here. It's not just the sodium that's being approached, but when it forms that bond, the other side of the water molecule is also being attracted away 
from the crystal by other water molecules that are associating with that one that's attached to the crystal. So they all apply an enormous force that yanks that sodium out of the crystal. Now, how do we know that that force is large? Because we know how much force is required to disrupt the crystal, to break the bonds between that sodium and the rest of the crystal. Think about it. What temperature would it take? And this is not quantitative, but is it a low or a high temperature that it would take to melt sodium? You ever cooked on a, on a skillet? Right, you got your grease in the pan and you got your salt over here and you want to salt your food, but you accidentally sling some salt into the pan. Right? And the pan is pretty hot. You don't want to touch it. But what does that sodium do? It just sits there. I mean, sodium chloride, excuse me, sodium chloride crystals. It just sits there in the pan. Right? It's still a crystal. And there's a lot of heat there. So that should indicate that it takes an enormous amount of energy to disrupt the sodium chloride crystal. So that means there's a whole lot of pulling going on with that solvent, the water molecules, to break up the crystal. But it seems like it happens with such ease, right? You throw salt in water, within a minute, it's gone. It's in solution. <laughs> So that gives you a relative idea of the forces that are involved in this solvation process. Okay, so um, I got ahead of myself. The solute is the substance that's being dissolved and most often is the smaller amount. The solvent, in this case liquid water, is the larger amount. Now there are exceptions to that definition, but, and I'm gonna give you one of them. Everybody I know of <clears throat> has at one time or another made their own hummingbird uh, solution to put in the feeder, right? Out of table sugar and water. So if you have water and you have sucrose, put them together. First you start out with a lot of water. Well, maybe not. Let's just assume that you start out with a lot of water and um, you may even heat it up. And then you, you put your sugar in there. Maybe two scoops, three scoops, whatever it takes. 50-50 is what you're shooting for. Well, you start off with a little bit of sugar and a lot of water and it goes into solution pretty quick. That establishes the, the water as the solvent and sugar as the solute. Right? But what happens if you go past 50-50 to where sugar is the major component and water is the minor component? Does it still go into solution? The answer is yes. The solubility of sugar in water is enormous. You can have a solution of sucrose in water that's over 80% sugar. Now, based on this definition, if that's all we knew, we would say that the sugar is the solvent and water is the solvent. But we go back to our starting conditions. We started off with a lot of water and a little bit of solute. So that's what we anchor is where did you start? We started with a lot of water and a little bit of sucrose. So that means even though we have large amounts of sucrose in there now, that's the solute and water's the solvent still. Okay, uh, another defin definition, electrolytes. Um, electrolyte is, this is an operationally defined term. An electrolyte is anything that is dissolved in water that is capable of conducting electricity. In other words, if you put 
if you have pure water, and I mean ultra pure, nothing there but water, and you have a battery with like that, and a light bulb. that there we go we've made the connection and the electrodes are in the water so what happens to the light bulb the answer is nothing pure water is an insulator <clears throat> unless the voltage is high enough but let's say we've, we're only using um, a 9 volt battery that's not enough to cross that that boundary between one electrode and the other. So why is it a, a, a why is pure water an insulator? Because there's there are no ions. There's nothing to migrate the charge. In other words, if this is the negative and this is the positive, you got to have something to complete the circuit, something to transfer the charge from one electrode to another. For the circuit to operate and water will not do that but if you put an electrolyte in there like sodium chloride or like hydrochloric acid that dissociates into ions then the ions are mobile and uh you're going to add extra electrons here and the chlorides are going to carry that over here so that's an electrolyte. It will conduct electricity when dissolved in water. Uh, now, anybody that's had a, uh, um, uh, a physical examination and you had to submit samples for analysis, like urine samples, uh, blood samples, um, they will do an analysis that gives the doctor um, a term. Well, it may have a, a, a heading that says these are the electrolytes in this person's blood or in their urine. And it'll list them, the electrolytes. Well, those electrolytes are the ones that conduct electricity in aqueous solution. They may be sodium, they may include chloride, they may include potassium, uh, they may include uh, others that are not quite as soluble but still work, magnesium, calcium, those are all under the electrolyte category. Okay, definitions. Um, a strong electrolyte is a compound that completely dissociates in water and conducts the current through the water very efficiently. So the light's gonna be bright. A high current runs through that solution because of that strong electrolyte. A weak electrolyte is a molecule that dissociates only slightly and therefore the light bulb will be dim. Uh, examples are weak acids like um, acetic acid. Okay, acetic acid will only dissociate partially and give you those ions. Most of it is up here, which will not conduct electricity. But there are a few of those, only a few. And non-electrolytes, of course, are things that will not conduct electricity. And I just talked about a perfect example, sucrose. When you put sucrose in water, it dissolves in water, but it does not dissociate into ions. So it will not conduct electricity. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. Oh, we're supposed to, uh, let's see. This is a demo. Strong electrolyte. What will happen? Strong electrolytes dissociate completely to give ions in solution that conduct electrical current. Soluble salts, strong acids, and strong bases act as strong electrolytes in solution. Okay. So those strong acids that we, we've studied um, 
when we were naming compounds like hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, uh, or strong bases like sodium hydroxide would completely dissociate and provide good conductors for electricity. Weak electrolytes dissociate to a small extent to be <clears throat> only a few ions in solution available to conduct electrical current. Weak acids and bases are the most common weak electrolytes. Okay, and then non-electrolytes. Non-electrolytes are molecular species that do not dissociate into ions in solution. There are no ions available to conduct electrical current. Molecular compounds like alcohols and sugars are examples of non-electrolytes. Okay. So let's look at chemical reactions that occur in solution. So in order for that to happen, you, you have to have a solution. In other words, the solute must go into solution, that is, it must dissolve in the solvent. And how do we know? How, how can you tell that you have a solution? Well, one of the simplest ways is um, you put your solute into the solvent and you can still see it, right? You can see the particles. Even if they're very small, if you shine a light through them, then uh, you can see the light beam. That's called the Tyndall effect. T-Y-N-D-A-L-L, -L. I think it's two L's. The Tyndall effect. Uh, those are not solutions. If you can see the light beam, if the light beam goes through and you see it come out the other side, like maybe on the surface of the glass, but you don't see it in the uh, mixture, then you have a solution. Um, now, another way to characterize solutions is how much of the compound is actually dissolved in the solution. And this is a, an intensity factor. And remember what intense and an intensive property is one in which uh, the amount of the mixture that you have doesn't matter. The description, the intensive description is the same no matter how much you have. And concentration is a perfect example of that. No. Um, so if we have, um, let's say, uh, two grams of um, sodium chloride dissolved in 100 grams of solution, roughly 100 milliliters, that's an intensive property. We could have 200 grams of that solution. How much of the sodium chloride would we have? Well, we'd have four, but the ratio is still the same. So concentration is a property that you must know in a chemical reaction. It's either an answer to a problem or it's information that you need to answer a question. So how do we express concentration? Uh, one of the most useful ways is called molarity. And that's derived from moles and it's given a large M symbol. Large M is chosen not just because it's uh, related to molarity, of course it is, but there's no element on the periodic table that is designated by a single M. So when you put it in a description of a reaction, um, there's no chance that big M is gonna be mistaken for an element rather than an indicator of concentration. So how do we define it? Well, it's a formula, right? Molarity or big M equals the number of moles of the solute dissolved in one liter of solution. That's it. So since it's a formula, if you know two of these factors, you can solve for the third one. 
If you're calculating molarity, then you need to know how many moles of the solute, in this case, uh, hydrogen chloride, are dissolved in two liters of solution. And then you can calculate that that is a three molar hydrochloric acid solution. Notice hydrogen chloride, when it's separate as a molecule, hydrochloric acid when it's dissolved in water. So it's a three molar solution and that's very concentrated. It would be dangerous for you to submerge your hand in that solution. Uh, if we knew that the solution was three molar and we knew that we had two liters of it, then we could say, we could calculate how many moles of hydrogen chloride were contained in that amount of solution. We just need to solve for this unknown. Remember, I, I say it over and over again. If you have a, a formula or a, an equation and you have all of the factors accounted for except for one, you can solve for that unknown. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, if you have 500 grams of potassium phosphate and you dissolve in enough water to make 1.5 liters of solution, what's the molarity? Well, what are we given? We're given a mass of potassium phosphate and we're given a final solution. So that means for our calculation equals number of moles and a, remember a small n means moles per liters of our volume. So we know what this one is. Right, we got that one. Moles of potassium phosphate. Do we have that one? The answer is no, we don't. We have to calculate it. We do know the mass and we know the name of the compound. That's why I insisted upon competence in naming compounds. Because if you can't write the formula of this compound, you'll never be able to calculate how many moles you have. So potassium phosphate, we know we have potassium, we know we have phosphate, which is a polyatomic ion, and I give you a whole list of them. If you look it up, phosphate has a three minus charge. Potassium is an alkaline metal. It has one plus charge. It's in the first group. So now we have to have three potassiums to balance the three minuses. So K3PO4 is our formula. So now how are we gonna uh, convert 500 grams to moles? Well, you need to know the molar mass. This is a, a dimensional analysis problem. What's the molar mass of K3PO4? I think I've got it down here. Here it is, 212.27 grams. How did we get that? We multiplied three times the molar mass of potassium, which is 39.10 and three times that. Then add phosphorus, read it off the chart, four times 16 for oxygen, add them together. That's your molar mass, grams per mole. Now, we don't have to put it on top because we need grams canceled, so we put grams on the bottom. Remember, all conversion factors are equal to one, so you can flip them upside down if you need to. Cancel the grams, divide that into 500. That's how many moles of potassium and phosphate you have. Now you can fill in this value. And calculate your molarity. There it is, 1.57 molar. So how did we know to solve this problem? Well, we look at the question first. What's the question? The question is, what's the molarity, right? So we know in order to calculate the molarity, we need those two values. And then we look at the stuff that's given to us. We find out that that's given. Problem solved there. This was the real problem. How many moles? Then you say, how do I get moles from grams? In order to get moles from grams, you need molar mass. 
but you can't calculate molar mass until you write the formula, right? So stepwise, you say, what's the question? What am I given? What do I need to do to get there? Then you go step by step. Okay. Um, hold just a second. Just a second. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so now that we calculated the concentration of the entire molecule, potassium phosphate. But when it goes in solution, what do you get? Well, you actually get three. For every mole of potassium phosphate, you get three moles of potassium ions. And you get one mole of phosphate ions, okay? So what's the concentration of this? Well, we, we calculated that as, uh, let's see, we go back, 1.57. Okay, now, What's the concentration? That this is a different example. I'm doing the one we were just working on. What's the concentration of potassium ions in solution? It's three times that, right? Because for every one mole of these, you get three of those. So the concentration is three times that. What's the concentration of phosphate? Well, it's the same as because for every one of these, you get one of those, okay? Now, What's the total ion concentration in this solution? It's the concentration of that one plus the concentration of that one. So it's three times this plus one of those. So it's four times that value. Why is that important? Well, let's look at it from a medical perspective. Suppose you were supposed to make up a solution that's going to be injected into a patient. And it was supposed to be uh, like a, I don't know, a 0.01 molar ion concentration, right? To be isotonic with the patient's body fluids. Now, don't, don't hold me on that. I'm just making that up. <clears throat> but let's say you know what the concentration needs to be, um, total concentration of ions, so that you won't damage the patient's blood cells or any of their tissues. So you say, okay, we're gonna make this solution up out of potassium chloride, right? So you say, okay, we need uh, 0.01 molar potassium chloride. So you make up the solution, you inject it in your patient, hour later your patient's dead. Why? Because you made up a 0.01 molar solution of potassium chloride when you injected a 0.02 molar ionic strength solution into your patient. Okay, let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> be careful. Now, of course, these days, all those solutions are pre-made, but somebody had to make them and they need to know this stuff or they're gonna kill people. Uh, okay, and this is just another example. Um, and I'm not gonna labor this one because we've already talked about the topic in terms of potassium phosphate. Um, which one contains the greatest number of ions? All right, so here's a problem for Henry Ford.
and I'm just going to set it up. Which one contains the greatest number of ions? Well, you need to know the total number of ions, right? So what's the total concentration of sodium? I mean, how many sodium chloride units are there in 400 milliliters at 0.1 molar? Look at the formula. What's the question? They're looking for this value right here, aren't they? Greatest number of ions. So you need to solve for that one. Molarity times volume equals moles. So if you multiply 0 0.1, this is the first example, 0 0.1 molar sodium chloride times what's 400 milliliters in liters? Move the decimal place three to the left. Okay, so 0.4 times 0.1 is 0 0.04 moles of sodium chloride. How many moles of ions is that? 0 0.08 moles of ions. Okay, so you do that for each one and then compare the numbers. And that's where setting it up like Henry Ford in, in a assembly line now, I will point out D is ludicrous. Why? Because sucrose does not make ions. Okay. So you only have to consider the first three. And if you do your calculations, you find out even though um, 300 milliliters is the intermediate volume at this concentration, it still has the most number of ions in solution. Okay, this is the author's idea of how to solve a problem. Where are we going? Another way of saying that is what's the question? What's the problem asking? How do we get there? I break that into two levels. What information are you given first? Then to answer the question, do you have every all the information you need? If you don't have all the information you need, then you look it up. Right in the useful information document that I give you, or in the periodic table, and then you plot out your strategy for solving the problem. Some problems can be solved like that, one step. Right, those are the ones that aren't worth much. The ones that are really worth a lot of points, or should be, are the ones that take more thinking subdivide your problem into units so that you solve, 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 and they, they cascade. Solve this one, then use that information to solve this one. If you break a big problem down into small units, then it's easier to solve. If you try to solve a huge problem, uh, even on paper, but certainly not in your head, then you're likely to fail because you have to logically break a problem apart into small units. So that's why as we instruct, as we go along, we learn these new skills. Then later on, we use those new found skills, skills in larger problems to solve those more complicated problems. We use earlier skills. That's why chemistry is called a cumulative science. In other words, you build on previous knowledge. And that's the way all the sciences are. Okay. Now, here's another problem. And I'm, I'm past 145, and I'm, actually, I'm surprised I've still got seven students, <clears throat> but I'll keep talking. Um, practical approach. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm a soil scientist. So in, in order to do what I do, very often we have to analyze soils for their extractable components and very often those are ionic right so we use uh, certain types of solutions sometimes just pure water but if we need to use a solution that's of a given concentration to extract a soil it's more convenient to make up a 
concentrated solution of that solute. And then later on, uh, because sometimes it takes a while for the solute to dissolve in the water. And if you have to make it up fresh at a low concentration each time, it's gonna take you a while to get there. So we make up stock solutions, we call them. They're concentrated. And then when we need to do the analysis, we just take a certain amount of stock and dilute it and use it. So here's how that works and why it works. Let's say we have, and the formula here, M, M1V1 equals M2V2. Um, if we have a, uh, let's say we have a concentrated solution of molarity one here. And we're going to put it in a container and we want to end up with molarity two, a lower value. So this is less than that. This is our concentrated one. So actually we don't have anything in this one yet. <clears throat> so um, intuitively, it should be obvious that if you take some of this out of here and put it in there and then add more solvent, then the concentration is going to decrease, right? Because molarity is moles divided by volume, right? If you put some moles in a solution and you add more volume in the denominator term, it makes the value smaller, right? If you make the denominator bigger, then the quotient gets smaller. So we're going to take some of this over here, uh, a volume one of this solution and put it in that container. And then the total volume over here is going to be volume two. Okay. Now ask yourself, what is the constant in this whole operation? What does not change from one side to the other? What does not change is the moles that you take out here are exactly the same as the moles you put in there. Okay? So we can say, what are the moles over here? Well, the moles over here, based on our previous example, are the molarity times the volume. Right? The volume we took out times its molarity equals the number of moles that we took out. How much did we put in over here? Well, we put in that many moles. So what is that mole equal to? That one is equal to this molarity times that volume. Right? So this one is equal to that one. That means they're all equal. So this term is equal to that term. That's where this one came from, right here. You could, you could write it, if it's more convenient, you could say uh, MCVC for concentrated equals uh, MDVD for diluted. That works just as well. Also notice that this is an equation. So if you know three of these values, you can solve for the third one. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> we want to produce a solution of this concentration and its total volume is that. And we want to make that solution from a more concentrated solution over here of known concentration. And we say, how much of that do we need to take out and dilute to that volume? Solve for it. Right? It's only one unknown, it's all for it. Okay, so this is an explanation that I just gave you on the board. I'm not going to labor that one anymore. <clears throat> all right, uh, let's see. <clears throat> this is a, a concept question. It's more or less a, a qualitative uh, concept verification.
let's say you have a half molar solution of sodium chloride in an open beaker uh, sitting out on a lab bench. Which of the following of, uh, of A through E would decrease the concentration of the salt solution? Right? Add water. The answer is yes. You're adding more solvent, so the concentration decreases. Pour some of the solution down the sink, down the drain. What does that do to the concentration? Absolutely nothing. Because concentration is an intensive property. If you take some of it out, you've still got the same concentration left in the beaker. Add more sodium chloride to the solution. What would that do? You're adding more solute, so the concentration increases, right? So that wouldn't work. So, so far, A is the only one that would decrease. Let the solution sit out on the open air for a couple of days. So what's happening there? Sodium chloride is not volatile, right? So it stays in the beaker. Water is volatile at a certain level. So the concentration of the solute decreases. I mean, um, the amount of solute, excuse me, the amount, the amount of solvent decreases over time, that's water, and as that decreases, the concentration goes up. And E, at least two of the above would decrease. No, we've only found one. A is the only one that answers that question. Okay, what's the minimum volume of two molar sodium hydroxide solution needed to make 150 milliliters of a 0.8 molar sodium hydroxide solution? This is the example I gave you two slides ago. You know what? What do we know? This is a, a, a very important <laughs> notice. <laughs> Always determine which values are what. Right? So if you have this relationship, concentrated equals diluted, which one goes where? The best way to handle a problem like that is to extract it from the word problem and put it on your paper or on the board in an e equivalence statement, right? So what is two molar sodium hydroxide versus 0.8 molar? The two molar is concentrated, right? The 0.8 molar is dilute. Okay, what's 150 milliliters? Well, we need to make 150 milliliters of 0.8 molar. So that is the diluted volume. So the unknown is actually the concentrated volume that we are taking out of the sodium hydroxide concentrated solution. Now, when you do it like that, then the values you stick in your formula will be in the right place. If you don't do this, then you might put this one over here and solve for that one and get the wrong answer. Um, another trick. Notice that this is molarity, right? It's M and M of certain amount. But the volume um, we normally think of is in, is in liters. But notice what happens. If you put this one on that side and this one on that side, what happens to the liters? The liters cancel. The ratio is the same no matter what the volume value is. So when you're using this ratio formula, MV, MV, you don't have to change the volume to liters. <clears throat> I can put 150 milliliters in here, <clears throat> solve for this one, and the answer will be in milliliters. <clears throat> Now, if you have to use 
the bare formula where molarity equals moles divided by volume, yes, you do have to have volume in liters. But <clears throat> with the ratio formula, you can leave it in milliliters and get the right answer. All right, so here we're laying it out. Then we can substitute it in the formula correctly and solve, and the answer is in milliliters. All right, just we say just two steps, converting the liters on the front side, converting to milliliters on the back side. Okay, what are the major types of chemical reactions? <clears throat> the major types of chemical reactions are these, and their bile means not the only kind, they're the major types. And what we may also say is that one reaction can be characterized by more than one type. Okay, so keep that in mind. Just because you say a reaction is acid-base reaction doesn't mean it can't be something else also. But we do characterize them for convenience as precipitation reaction. So what's a precipitation reaction? When you put two solutions together and you know they're clear because we shine light through them, we know their solutions. When you put them together, if there is a precipitation reaction, it gets cloudy. And why is it getting cloudy? Because the reaction is producing a solid that's suspended in the solution. If you wait long enough, that solid will settle out. That's a precipitate. Acid-based solutions, Simple. You have acid reacting with a base. It always gives you water and a salt. I'll show that to you later. Oxidation reduction reaction. Uh, I'm going to save that for a better definition. So hold that thought. It just means electrons are transferred. Other types of reactions. A combination reaction or a synthesis where two elements are combined to make a compound. And the reverse of that is decomposition, where you take a compound and you break it apart. A single displacement reaction, or single replacement. So you have, like that, right? So a compound reacting with an element, let's say that element is a metal, right? So it's gonna replace this one. So we get over here a CB plus A. So the A was replaced by C. A double replacement. A, B, C, D. So now the metal here is combined with a non-metal. And you swap places with Let's just, for convenience, say we swap the metals. So this one replaces that one, and that one replaces this one. So now we have CB plus AB. That's a double replacement reaction. A combustion reaction. A combustion reaction always has, as one of its reactants, oxygen. So whatever we got over here, no matter what it is, it's different than that one. Produces products. That's a combustion reaction. Uh, okay, so for example, that combustion reaction is also and always an oxidation reduction reaction. So that's an example of one that has can be characterized two ways. Okay, uh, let's see. So a precipitation reaction is always a double displacement, a replacement reaction, right? So what happens? Well, these are in solution. 
one of these, sometimes both, but usually just one, one of those makes a solid and the other one stays in solution, right? So that's our precipitate, a double replacement that makes a precipitate. Here's an example, barium nitrate plus potassium chromate. And we just swap the potassium with the barium. So the potassium goes over here, right? Shows up over there, right? And the barium goes over here, combines with the chromate. Barium chromate is insoluble in water. That's why it forms a solid. And this, actually, this is a photograph of what happens after we let the solid settle. So there's our barium chromate on the bottom. Now, how do you know that you have a solid? Because this is one of those reactions where I may give you this one and that one, and you have to tell me what the products are. So how do you know whether it forms a solid or not? Well, there's a, a chart that I give you in your useful information at the end of your review document, and it'll be there at the end of the exam too. And I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, maybe not. I'll show it to you in just a minute. <clears throat> in this animation of a precipitation reaction, the silver ion, shown in gray, and the chloride ions, shown in green, are active participants in the reaction and combine to form the insoluble silver chloride crystal. Other ions, called spectator ions, shown here in blue and purple, are not participants in the reaction and remain unchanged in the solution. Okay. So um, <clears throat> when we say something is soluble, it essentially, the solid dissolves in the solution. And we follow it with this AQ for aqueous as our uh, identifier. If it's insoluble, we follow it with an S for solid. Now, <clears throat> in, for now, Insoluble and slightly soluble are used interchangeably. Um, and we'll, you'll learn, um, I think it's in the second semester chemistry, where we actually calculate the solubility of something that we once thought was insoluble. We calculate a value for that. So this slightly soluble something, we're gonna call it insoluble for now. Okay, these are the rules for solubility. Now, I'm not gonna make you memorize these because you're not gonna be chemists. At least I don't think you are. Uh, you can memorize them if you want to, that's fine. They're laid out a certain way so that um, if, you, if you have uh, one rule conflicting with another rule, the one above takes precedence. So if we have something down here, say, uh, Say we have, is silver nitrate soluble? Well, uh, excuse me, no, um, chloride. That's not a good example. Well, let's just say, if you have a conflict between two of these rules, the one above takes precedence. So what that basically means is anything combined with nitrate, any metal combined with nitrate is soluble, period. End of story. Um, most alkali metals, that is sodium, potassium, lithium, those are soluble and ammonium are soluble with a very few uh, exceptions. So if you memorize these, which I had to do when I was uh, in school, 
um, it'll take some time and time is, is precious. So what I've done is I've created, or actually not created, I've extracted a solubility table. And I'm going to go down and show it to you. Where is it? Here it is. Here's the solubility table. Now this has the rules down here also, but in order to use it, you take the cation or the, the first component in your compound, find it up here, and then you follow it down until it uh, runs into the anion part of the compound. And if the, the square is clear, it's soluble in water. If it's grayed out, it's insoluble. Okay, it's real simple. Um, so let me go back. I skipped a bunch of stuff. Here we go. Okay, which of the following ions form compounds with lead 2 plus that are generally soluble in water? Well, you pull out that um, pull out that table, and here it is. It's the last page of your review document. So you just uh, say, okay, let's find lead. Uh, and lead is way out here on the right end. And go down and say, which ones are soluble? Well, these first four are soluble. So you look over here and say, which ones of these are soluble? Well, it looks like uh, nitrate, um, chloride, chlorate, and acetate. Well, the only one that's in this list is nitrate. That's soluble. The rest of them are not. They're insoluble, except for this one boogaboo. And why is that one not valid? Right? <laughs> you don't form, you don't form an ionic compound with two cations, right? So E is just stupid. It's put in there to just see if you're paying attention, right? So the nitrate is the only one that's soluble in water, and that's rule number one. All nitrates are soluble. Okay, now when we write an equation, this is real important stuff here. When we write an equation, we've learned up to this point how to balance that equation, right? So this is silver nitrate plus sodium chloride solution. These are both aqueous solutions. When you combine those two, you get silver chloride, which is a solid or a precipitate, plus sodium nitrate, right? And that can be balanced. Uh, as written, it is balanced. We don't have to do anything to it. One, one silver on both sides, one nitrate on both sides, one sodium on both sides, one chloride on both sides. So it's already balanced. Now, this is called the molecular equation, where everything is, uh, is treated as individual neutral molecules. <clears throat> but in solution, we know that if these things are soluble, we have a silver plus one ion, a nitrate minus one ion, a sodium plus one ion, and a chloride plus one ion in solution before we add them together. When we add them together, we get this combination of silver and chlorine or chloride that produces silver chloride solid that settles out. That's a precipitate. But the sodium and the nitrate are still in solution as ions, just like they were before. So this molecular equation can be written as the next one, individual ions here. And then when we get combination on the product side, we have the solid and the sodium and the nitrate are there. Okay, that's called the complete ionic equation. Now what's happened? Well, the silver ion traded places with the sodium ion, combined with a chloride and produced that solid, the double replacement reaction. And what's left over? Well, sodium and nitrate are left over and they are both, uh, the sodium nitrate solution, uh, solute is soluble. So notice you got the same on both sides, nitrate and sodium. Those are what we call spectators. 
they don't participate in the precipitation part of the reaction. So we could write this equation as a net ionic equation. Just cross out the ones that occur on both sides, the spectators, right? And that's your net ionic equation. Now, why is that valuable? Well, from a practical matter, let's back up. From a practical matter, we could, uh, let's say we don't have sodium, uh, or uh, let's say we have silver nitrate, but we don't have sodium chloride in our lab, which is kind of ludicrous. Everybody's got sodium chloride. Well, this for argument's sake, we don't have sodium chloride. Somebody stole it and they're using it to season their food. But we do have potassium chloride in on the shelf. We take the same molar concentration of potassium chloride as sodium chloride, and we get exactly the same reaction. Okay, that's what's value about the, valuable about the net ionic equation. Because it doesn't matter what the source of the chloride is, we still get this precipitate. All right. So what do you do? If you're given a problem where you have to react this compound with that compound, that's all you're given. And the question is, first, balance the equation. Well, you have to know what the products are. It's a double replacement. Then balance the equation. Then write the, the next question is, what's the complete ionic equation? So you just bust up your ions. And then you determine which ones are solid. You've already done that. Right? When you write the molecular equation, you've already determined that this is a precipitate. It's insoluble. Right? So that one does not break apart. That one stays the same. The rest of them are ions. That's your complete ionic equation. Then all you have to do is cross out the spectators, the ones that are the same on both sides, nitrate in this case, and chloride. And that gives you the net ionic equation. Right? So I've got one or two examples of that in your uh, review document for you to play with. And uh, there will be one like that on the exam where you have to go through the whole, all those steps to get down to the net ionic equation. Okay, so here's another example. The formula equation is their idea of molecular equation. And actually formula equation is more accurate because ionic compounds are not molecules. They're crystal structures. So actually, their wording is better than mine. <clears throat> Complete ionic equation and net ionic equation. Simple. So let's say we have a reaction uh, like one of those where you produce a precipitate. And you need to approach it from a stoichiometric problem solution angle. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you need the balanced equation. You have to identify the precipitate, if there is one. Uh, then you follow a similar pattern to earlier stoichiometries. You got to find out how many moles of the reactants there are. All right? We did it with uh, mass before. Now we're going to do it with solutions, right? And we know how to calculate moles if we have so many milliliters of a molar solution concentration, multiply them together after you change the milliliters to liters, and you get moles, right? So there you have moles. You can go anywhere in the equation once you have moles. Then you find out which one's limiting, right? So how do you do that? Well, you take the moles of one reactant and say, how much product will it produce if all of it is converted? And you take the other reactant and do the same thing. The one that's limiting is the one that produces the least amount of product. Then you can do your calculations for product. 
Well, you've already done, actually, if you do it correctly, you've already done one of them. You just take the one that gives you the least amount and that's your product moles. And then you convert back to um, whatever the units are required by the problem. Does it need to be calculated in terms of solution concentration? If it's not the precipitate, yeah, maybe so. What do you have left? Or if you're trying to find out what's the mass of the precipitate, then you use molar mass to convert the moles into mass. All right, so there we're gonna breeze by that. Now this, uh, let me see. I'm running short of time, I have to be somewhere, so let me see if I've got time to, to do one of these. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this one and I'm gonna let you attempt this stoichiometric problem in the review document. There are several of them in there. Uh, and answer these questions. When you do that, you're gonna to need to know, is there precipitate formed? What is it? And maybe you need to know what's the mass of the precipitate. Right? So you have to go through those steps that I just described. And if you get stuck, Go to the worked problem. I work out the problem for you. I show you how it's done. So I'm not going to take time to do that right here. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the next slide. And the next one. All right. Well, this is approaching the problem uh, that we just saw on the previous slide. To find the mass of the solid. All right, what ions are being reacted? What's the precipitate? Then you write the balanced equation, right? Once you have the balanced equation, you can find out how many moles. Okay, here's a shortcut. If you multiply molarity times milliliters of something, then instead of moles, you get millimoles, right? A thousandth of a mole, because you got a thousandth of a liter. So if you need to calculate the concentration from millimoles, you just need the millimoles um, divided by milliliters. Right? If you take this term and put it over here, then you get molarity. So millimoles divided by milliliters is molarity. If that's too much for you, in, instead of doing milliliters, change it to liters and you end up with moles. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But here we have um, moles of reactants that are present in solution. So we calculate the moles first. Right, you can't go anywhere in a balanced equation unless you have moles. Right, so which is the limiting reactant? Right, so we use all of the sodium phosphate to produce the precipitate. And then we use all of the lead nitrate to produce the precipitate. We find out the lead nitrate is the limiting one. Right, that's what we're saying, it produces the least amount. All right. So how many moles of lead, of lead phosphate were produced? Well, these are millimoles. So the number of moles is just times 10 to the minus third. Right? So this is the moles, 1.33 millimoles times 10 to the minus third is moles. Then you use your molar mass to find the mass of uh, lead to phosphate. Okay, this is a trick question. What's the concentration of nitrate ions left over after the solution reacts? The nitrate is a spectator. So you can calculate how many moles of nitrate do you start with? Then the only thing that changes is the volume because you put two solutions together, the volume's not the same anymore. 
so the concentration of nitrate goes down. But we calculate the total amount of nitrate in solution. Um, since we started out with 0 0.04 moles of lead nitrate, we actually have 0 0.008 moles of nitrate. Why? Because there are two moles of nitrate for every one mole of lead nitrate. So this is how many moles of nitrate you have. What's the final volume? Well, the total volume is the summation of the two. 10 plus 20 is 30. There's your calculation. All right. Now, if we need to do more complicated calculation, what's the concentration of phosphate ions that are left in solution after the reaction is complete? We're going we're gonna to use up all the lead nitrate, but sodium phosphate is in excess. We just determined that. So we're going to have extra phosphate. How much phosphate did we use? Well, you've got to take the, the uh, lead nitrate and say how much sodium phosphate is required. So that's what this calculation does. It says, all right, so we have 0 0.003 moles of phosphate, but we only need 0 0.027 moles of phosphate in that chemical reaction. And we did that calculation earlier. So the difference is 0 0.000 33 moles and divided by the final volume, which is 0.03 liters. So that's what's left in solution of the phosphate. All right, now to different types of concentrate of uh, reactions. Acid base reaction. An acid is a proton donor. A base is a proton acceptor. All right, so that just means You need a proton donor, and I use A for the counter ion. There's your proton. It's always written first, right? That's why we write HC2H3O2 as acetic acid. Notice acetic acid has more than one H in it. That's the only one that's acidic. That's the only one that dissociates. These are locked in place. That's why we write it that way. So acids are always written with the protons that dissociate first. Any other hydrogens that are part of the molecule come later, buried in the rest of the molecule. Right? A proton acceptor is anything that will take that proton. All right, a lot of them are like this. Hydroxyls like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide. So what's the proton acceptor here? It's this one. All right? There's your proton. There's your acceptor. What do you get? That's why acid-base reactions always produce water as a product. And the net ionic equation for an acid base reaction is protons plus hydroxyls yield water. Now, there are exceptions, but we're not going to beat that horse right now. This is where we're going to stay for now. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid that completely dissociates to form H plus and chloride ion in solution. The H plus ion is rapidly solvated by water, forming the hydronium ion as shown. The hydronium ion reacts with the hydroxide ion from the dissociated strong base sodium hydroxide to form water. In this neutralization reaction, sodium and chloride are spectator ions that do not participate in the reaction. All right. So that's an acid base reaction. A strong acid and a strong base. Um, we'll talk about uh, weak acids and weak bases in the second semester. Okay, so when you have an acid base reaction, you approach it similarly to any reaction in which 
the, um, the protons and the hydroxyls combine, they don't, produce, they don't produce a solid, but they do produce water. Um, and you approach it similarly. What are the spectator ions? The spectator ions are this thing and that thing. They're the same before and after, but they combine. And that's why we say an acid-base reaction always produces water and a salt. The cation plus the anion is our salt. Now, this salt is usually, usually solid, but not always. If you combine a cation and an anion, look it up on your chart, you may see that that reaction produced a precipitate. Now, in that case, the net ionic equation uh, will be the same as the um, molecular equation, right? Because you can't get rid of the solid, right? Those are rare. Okay. <clears throat> so when we have a acid-base reaction, um, many times we are combining uh, a known volume a known volume of an acid of a known molarity and we're combining it with a base of known volume but we don't know the molarity, so we solve for that term. Now, this works, this relationship works if only one proton combines with one hydroxyl. If you have a polyprotic acid or a base that has more than one hydroxyl, then that will not work because molarity doesn't take into account multiples. So in that case, we use another term called normality. So what's normality? Normality takes into account <clears throat> the the presence of multiples. Let me show you an example. Say we have 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid and 0.1 molar sulfuric acid. What's the normality? This one is the same. Right? It has, and instead of saying moles, we say equivalents. The equivalents per liter. So how many equivalents does this represent? Well, actually, 0.1 mole of this is 0.2 moles of hydrogen. So we have 0 0.2 normal H2SO4. Okay. So now that you have that value, you can use this formula. Okay, so when we titrate, um, we're adding let's say we're adding into a known volume 25 milliliters of an unknown concentration of base and we're adding into it through a burette uh, a concentration of 0 0.1 molar uh, acetic acid. Okay, so we add until we find out that this 
the number of moles added here is equal to the number of moles there. Right? So since we don't know the molarity, the molarity of the base times 25 milliliters is equal to the molarity of the acid. Since they're one to one, we can do that times whatever volume we add. So let's say we add, it turns out we add 25 milliliters of acid. Right? In that case, the molarity here is equal to 0 0.1 molar. That's how we know the exact concentration of this unknown base. How do we know when we get there? Well, we need to know when is the equivalence? When is the number of moles of acid equal to or equal equivalent to the number of moles of base? That's the equivalence point. Uh, now you can determine the equivalence point with a titration uh, curve using a pH meter. You know, measure as you go and from that curve you can determine exactly where it is. But it takes a long time to do one sample. Suppose you got a hundred samples that have to be determined before the day's out. You need a quicker way. So we approximate the equivalence point with the end point. And the end point for acid base reactions, 99 times out of a hundred is a color change. So we put a drop of an indicator in this solution. And when we, get close to the equivalence point, color changes, or the color disappears. Or it's clear to begin with and the color appears, but it's a color change. And that way you can do a hundred samples in an hour, easy. That's the difference between equivalence point and end point for a titration. Now this is an acid base titration. You have hundreds of different types of titrations and they depend on different types of chemistry, but an acid base titration works here. All right, I'm not gonna labor this one because I don't have time. What's a redox reaction? A redox reaction is stands for oxidation and reduction. An oxidation reaction requires that a transfer of electrons has occurred. That's why a combustion reaction is always an oxidation because you can you're transferring electrons in a combustion. So a reduction equals a gain of electrons. An oxidation is a loss of electrons. That could be more than one electron, not just one. And they always occur together. One never occurs without the other one. So how do you remember which is which? Well, we've got a mnemonic for you. Oil rig, oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. There you go. That tells you what an oxidation reduction is. So how do you know you have an oxidation reduction? Well, there are some shortcuts. But the only way to know with certainty is you need to determine the oxidation state of each of the components in the reaction. So you need rules to do that. Um, let's see. We need to know the oxidation state of every ion or every element in the reaction. Rule number one, <clears throat> the oxidation state of a free element 
is always zero. So if you have sodium metal, its oxidation state is zero. No charge, oxidation state zero. Oxidation state of a monatomic ion, like this one, is the charge. So its oxidation state is, is plus one. Or if we had uh, oxygen ion, it would be a minus two, right? Unless it's in a peroxide. If it's like this, then each one of those is minus one. But that's an exception. Any other time, it's a two minus. Now, <clears throat> when we're saying oxidation states, we're not necessarily saying charge because you can calculate an oxidation state for a covalent component. This is a bookkeeping method. It may look like ions, but it doesn't necessarily have to be ions. Uh, hydrogen is always taken as plus one in a covalent compound, right? Um, fluorine is always minus one, right? It's a halogen. Uh, the other halogens can be calculated if we follow these rules, step one, two, three, and do these first, then you may get down to a halogen, which you have to calculate the oxidation state. Now, if you have a compound, the oxidation states are always zero because it's neutral. If you have a polyatomic ion, then the oxidation states have to add up to the charge on the ion. So for this one, all of the oxidation states taken together have to add up to two minus. So what does that mean for this one? Well, oxygen is two minus. We said that earlier. Right? So what's the total charge or what's the total oxidation states for oxygen? Two times that four is eight minus. Right? We need to hold out two of those minuses for that one. So we can only neutralize six minuses. That means sulfur is six plus. That's how you calculate the oxidation state of sulfur. Now, if we had something like this, right, that would be six minus, four minus to give you the two minus charge, Oxidation state there is four plus, and here is six plus. So sulfur can be multiples, depending on the ion or the compound. Now, once you've learned those rules, then we can actually do something with them. Okay, I'm running out of time. I may have to, rather than, uh, what I'm gonna do, is I'm going to stop the video here and come back and finish it later. Uh, let me mark my place. Um, I know there's not much to go, but there's a lot of talking that needs to be done. So I'm going to, here, there. I'm gonna come back and finish the video. So uh, I see Gail and you're the only one left. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> but I have to be somewhere in 15 minutes so I'm gonna come back and finish it. And then when I create the second video, I'm gonna splice them together before I post them to Blackboard. And then you can see the rest of the show. So I do apologize. Okay, I'm back for uh, Chem 101, Chapter 4. And we're gonna finish, I'm gonna back up just a little bit. Let me, I have to open the, uh, let's see, let's go back to this one and share. See if I can get this share to work. All right. Now we're good. Okay. <clears throat>
we were, before I had to leave, we were talking about oxidation reduction reactions and the assignment of oxidation states. Oxidation states uh, is a way of bookkeeping so that we, uh, we can balance out the movement of electrons from one place to another. So we have to know the oxidation state of every component or every part of reactions, reactants and products so that we can decide um, how many electrons are moving, where are they coming from, and where are they going to. <clears throat> so we follow these rules in order, and you start at the top, and you do, do them one at a time, um, just like they're stated. And then anything left over has to be calculated after these values have been assigned to the uh, the not permanent, but uh, the first logical steps after they've been taken, then you can assign uh, oxidation states to the other elements in the reaction. So we're going to look at these examples. Um, first thing you notice is that um, all of these but one are compounds. That is, the oxidation states for potassium dichromate, um, manganese 4 oxide, uh, phosphorus pentachloride, and sulfur uh, tetrafluoride, all of those oxidation states must add up to zero because these are neutral compounds. Whereas this species, the carbonate polyatomic ion, the requires that the oxidation states add up to uh, negative two. Right. So let's look at this first one. Potassium <clears throat> dichromate. All right, we know that oxygen is assigned a negative two. And potassium is assigned a plus one. Those are fixed. So with those values in hand, we can calculate the oxidation state for chromium. <clears throat> Seven times two minus is 14 minus. And two times plus two is two pluses. So the difference between these two, when we add them together, we get 12 minus. <clears throat> if the compound is neutral, has to add up to zero, then chromium has to supply 12 positive oxidation states to counter the 12 minuses. So these two chromiums have to be 12 positives. But there are two chromium atoms in this molecule. So each one will take half of the responsibility. So each one of these chromiums is going to be 6 plus oxidation state. And we should get those results here. There we go. All right. Uh, let's do the polyatomic carbonate. Okay. CO2. Two minus. Uh, CO3, excuse me. CO3, two minus. Uh, if we go down our list, first one we come to is oxygen, which is two minus for each one. So two minus times three is six minus for oxygen. But we have to reserve two minuses for the overall charge on the polyatomic. So that means we only have to match four minuses with our carbon. That means carbon is four plus. 
right? So six minus and four plus is two minus. And let's see, that should be verified here. Yes. Now I'm gonna skip down to a, um, a covalent compound. Remember, covalents don't have ions, but we use oxidation state calculations to help us uh, tally electrons and transfers of electrons. So let's go down to, um, let's go down to phosphorus pentachloride. Okay, we're gonna skip uh, uh, manganese four oxide. We're going to go down to phosphorus and to chloride. Right? The oxidation states have to add to zero, and we have a choice here. Which one is more likely? We really can't tell what phosphorus is. If you look on your periodic table and you see, you see a whole host of oxidation states for phosphorus. And you see a lot of them for chlorine too. But when you have to choose between these two, you fix the one to the right, which means chlorine is gonna be fixed at one minus. So that's a decision, a choice that has to be made. If it were fluorine, no problem. Fluorine would be minus one, no other choice. Chlorine, we have other possibilities, but when it's paired with phosphorus, Chlorine gets the fixed oxidation state at minus one. So now we have five minuses that have to be accounted for. That means phosphorus would be five pluses. Okay. And we can follow the same reasoning for uh, sulfur tetrafluoride. And this one would be easy because fluoride is always minus one. So that means sulfur has to be plus four to balance four minuses and come out with a neutral summation. <clears throat> All right. So now that we have an idea of how to calculate oxidation states, we're going to use that in a chemical reaction to track the movement of electrons. Um, we've already covered this. I already gave you the uh, mnemonic oil rig to say that oxidation is loss and reduction is gain of electrons. Uh, but one thing I didn't say was, uh, let's see if we've got an example here. Ye let's see. Yeah, let's use this example. One term that it did not define for you um, is the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. It's really very simple. So let me show you by example. Let's say we have zinc and this is a solid and we're going to put it in some hydrochloric acid. There. And what we end up with is, uh, let's see, zinc chloride. Um, gets two. And um, hydrogen gas. Okay, so there's our balanced equation, and you can satisfy yourself that it is balanced. <clears throat> and first we wanna identify um, the oxidation states so that we can uh, tally the movement and decide what's being oxidized, what's being reduced. All right, so all elements, have an oxidation state of zero. So zinc as an element and hydrogen as an element. 
are zero, oxidation states. Uh, in this one, remember hydrogen is taken as plus one, so chlorine has to be minus one. Over here, um, we have to choose. And we're gonna say that chlorine, because it's to the right of zinc, is the fixed one. So this one is one minus, and the total is two minus, so that means zinc has to be two plus to balance. Okay, so now we have all the oxidation states identified for this reaction, and we can tally which way the electrons move. All right, so if zinc is going to go from a zero to a two plus, how did it get there? Remember, we can't mess with the protons, only electrons. So if you go from a zero to a two plus, zinc had to lose two negative charges, or two negative oxidation states. All right, so we have two electrons being transferred in this case. Two electrons are lost. Okay. So remember what I said about oxidation reduction. They always occur in pairs. We've identified which one is the oxidation. So the other one must be a reduction. We have to decide which one involves reduction. So we look over here, we've got hydrogen is zero. But over here, hydrogen is one minus. I mean, uh, one plus, excuse me, one plus. So that means hydrogen had to gain an electron for each of the hydrogens. So we had one electron gain per hydrogen. But notice we have two hydrogens. So for two hydrogens, we have two electrons gained and two electrons lost in the process. And that is uh, an essential part of tallying and tracking electron movement in an oxidation reduction reaction. The number of electrons lost has to equal the number of electrons gained. So we have two here that were gained, which means reduction. And two electrons lost, which is oxidation. Okay. <clears throat> So, what's being oxidized? Zinc metal is being oxidized. And in order to oxidize, it has to transfer its electrons to something else, which means it is causing the reduction of some other species. So, anything that's oxidized is a reducing agent. Zinc in this case, because it's oxidized, is the reducing agent for hydrochloric acid, which is being reduced. Hydrogen in particular is being reduced. So that means it is the oxidizing agent because it is facilitating the oxidation of zinc. So this is the oxidizing agent. So be sure when you read a problem, you look for that term agent. If it says this is an oxidizing agent, it means it has to be reduced. And if it says this is a reducing agent, it has to be oxidized. All right. 
So this is an oxidation reduction reaction. We've just proved it. Now, one thing you'll notice is on this side of the equation, it's an element. And on this side of the equation, it's in a compound. Whenever that happens, you have an oxidation reduction reaction without doing any calculations, you know it's redox. When you have an element on one side and a compound on the other, and it goes works both ways, an element on this side came from a compound on this side. That's oxidation reduction. Now, if we, if we tallied the oxidation states for each of these, we would find that there was no change. No change in the chromium, in the oxygens, in the hydrogens. No change in oxidation state. So the B reaction is not a redox reaction. This one, look, use that rule, that hint I just gave you, that trick. Here's copper in a compound. Here's copper element. This is an oxidation reduction reaction. This is a special kind of oxidation reduction reaction. It's called disproportionation. And this happens when a compound uh, with a, a, um, a, an element that has a given oxidation state goes two directions. So let me draw that one. So we have an uh, two CuCl, and it's aqueous, and it's producing CuCl two. Uh, that's aqueous, and copper metal. Okay. Notice that there are two coppers on this side. One of them goes here and the other one goes there. So, um, let's assign our oxidation states. That's zero, because it's an element. This is chlorine, so we're gonna fix it, since it's to the right of copper, we're gonna fix it at minus one. That means two minuses for the total, that means this is two plus. Okay, this copper, we start at one minus here. With only one copper, it's one plus. So here we have one of these coppers goes here. It goes from a plus one to a plus two, which means it lost an electron. Okay. And the other copper went this direction. Gain from one plus to zero, gain one electron. Okay, so oil rig, oxidation, uh, no, reduction is gain, rig, reduction, oxidation. This is disproportionation. reaction. <clears throat> okay, so it's not that one copper split in two different directions, it's that in this balanced equation, one of those coppers was oxidized and the other one was reduced. See, we've got two of them. One of them ends up here, one of them ends up there. And this is an oxidation reduction reaction, okay? Now, which is the reducing agent? It's the one that's oxidized. So one of these is a reducing agent and the other one is an oxidizing agent, okay? Sounds funny, but it's true. Okay, so these are just, this is just a, um, 
a summation of what we've done already. You have to write the correct equation with reactants and products. Um, if you're using oxidation reduction chemistry to help you balance the equation, we haven't done that yet. We've only worked with balanced equations, but you can use the, uh, what we've learned so far to help you balance an equation. And that's what this talks about, balancing an oxidation reduction uh, reaction by using oxidation states. Now this is one method. There's another method that you'll learn in, uh, I think you get it in the second semester. It's called the method of half reactions. But this one works on a great many of them and simplifies the process of balancing an equation. Because in oxidation reduction reactions, not only do the number of atoms have to be the same on both sides, the numbers of each, the transfer of electrons has to be equal as well. So if you write the unbalanced equation, then you can use oxidation states to help you balance the equation. Now these are the rules, these are the steps. Um, and we need an example. I'm pretty sure we, we really need an example. So let's balance the reaction between uh, zinc and hydrochloric acid to produce aqueous uh, zinc 2 chloride and hydrogen gas. So we had that one balanced before. So why don't we look at it uh, in terms of balancing using oxidation reduction rules. You know, on second thought, we've already looked at that one. Let's, let's see if we can find, well, I guess, I guess this works. I won't have to write this one. I think I've got this one on the slides. So this is what the reaction would look like. If you know that you're adding zinc to hydrochloric acid, you write that first. And then what's the product? Well, you're given the product, of course. You have uh, zinc two plus ions, and you have chloride minus one ions in solution, and hydrogen gas. Right? So you determine the oxidation states. What are they? There they are. We did that before, only we did it with a balanced equation. This is unbalanced. But the oxidation states are exactly alike, whether you're balanced first or balanced afterwards. Right, the elements, zinc and hydrogen are zero. The chloride is given a minus one because it's a chloride ion, minus one. Zinc is a two plus ion. Uh, chloride over here, well, chlorine over here is given a minus one simply because it's to the right of hydrogen. And we're gonna fix it. And of course, hydrogen is given a plus one anyway. Right, that's one of the rules. So these are all our oxidation states. Now, this connector says that zinc goes from zero to plus two, which is two electrons that were lost from zinc. So that means something has to gain electrons. So we identify hydrogen as gaining one electron for each atom. And the only way that you can balance two electrons against one electron gain two electrons lost against one electron gain is to make sure that you have two from here because these two are gonna say that you have two electrons, but you're only starting with one, right? Gaining one, you need to gain two. So we need to put a two in front of the HCl. Okay, let's get some more, to get our information back up here. So times two means that in order to do that, we need two hydrogens. So here are the two hydrogens in the green, All right? So that takes care of the two hydrogens. Is that enough? Well, let's see if it is. No, it's not. Why? 
because when you multiply coefficient of two times HCl to satisfy the hydrogens, gaining two electrons, one each, then you've also changed the number of chloride ions. Right? So in order to balance the chlorides, we need two chlorides over here. All right, oops, back up. So that's finished. And um, it balanced the electrons, plus it balanced the atoms. And to satisfy yourself that the atoms are balanced, just look. One zinc, one zinc, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two chlorines, two chlorines. You're balanced. Now you can use that on more complex uh, redox reactions, uh, and it'll work just fine. And there are examples of that uh, in your review document. Okay, so I think, I think that's it. That's the end of this lecture on chapter four, types of chemical reactions and solution stoichiometry. And we'll pick up with, uh, on Thursday, I believe, let me check my, on Thursday, let's see, this is the 17th, no, I'm sorry, this is Thursday, Tuesday, okay, so between now and Tuesday, you will have worked through chapter three and chapter four, review problems and done the homework, uh, at um, OWL, Cengage OWL, and come up with problems, questions, um, those problems and questions that can wait. Um, if you have problems or questions beforehand, of course, contact me. And then we'll have that review session on Tuesday, and the exam will follow on Thursday. And then we'll immediately jump into gases at that point. All right. So that's the end of that. Let me stop the share. And stop the recording.